Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice and refreshing to see people for God's uh, sake. Yeah. So thank you for coming. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy New Year. Happy New Year. Great to see everybody. We're just going to make sure we can live stream ourselves and... Uh, Put the mics oh, on and everything. Welcome. Right now, <clears throat> Great to see everybody tonight. How y'all doing? All right. Good, good, good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Well, hello and uh, welcome. We're going to go ahead and officially start, giving a chance for all the cameras and everything to warm up just a little bit. But, uh, all right, well, let's get going. Great to have all of you. Hello, and welcome to today's discussion with Roya Hakapian, speaking on the topic of integration, myths, wonder, and realities. A very important and certainly relevant topic to us here in this community. I'm Marianne Maldonado, and on behalf of everyone at the Council, we want to say Happy New Year. Uh, it's our hope that you are healthy and you're keeping safe. And for those of us joining here, us here in person, welcome to all of you. For those of us, for those of you joining us online, we're so glad that we have an online audience, and we hope you enjoy tonight's program. Before we begin, I want to highlight some upcoming programs that we have. We have we're adding programs as we normally do almost all the time. So keep checking our websites and our different newsletters, because when we send your newsletter, it usually includes a new program. So on Thursday, we have an online free program. It's going to be Exploring the Stones, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan. So that's Thursday, January 13th. On the 19th, we have the Lords of Easy Money, How the Fed Reserve Broke, How the Fed Broke the American Economy with Christopher Leonard, and that's going to be here at Amnesty. And we have a great movie night that we're going to be hosting at the council offices. It's going to be uh, showing the Ukraine film Battleship Potemkin. That's going to be on the 26th. As well, on the 27th of this month, lots planned for the next couple of weeks, we have a program on the U.S. military, Combat, Conflict, and Command, with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kylie Ann Hunter and Catherine Kuzminski. She's the Director of Military Veterans and Society at the Center of New American Studies. So lots of exciting programs. All of that and more is available on our website at wachouston.org. And now, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, not only our great Director of Programs, Ronan O'Malley, but our speaker for this evening. Raya Hakakian is the author of, of Beginner's Guide to America, and uh, you can pick these up outside if you're interested. She's also author of Assassins of the Turquoise Palace and Journey from the Land of No. Her past work includes essay, essays in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and NPR's All Things Considered, and also collaborations on programming, uh, including TV 60 Minutes. She's recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and served on the editorial board of the World Affairs. And since 2015, she's taught a writing workshop. Very interesting. Is that online? No. <laughs> <laughs> a writing workshop at Yale and is a fellow at the Davenport College at Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Brea and my colleague. Well, thank you very much, Brea, and uh, Amity Bank for once again hosting us. And Roy, it's a delight to have you again here in Houston. Yes, absolutely. Um, we had a conversation last night in Woodland. 
and, and uh, rather than be tired of repeating the same thing, I'm actually excited because it went really well. <laughs> so. well. Well, thank you. And I know some of you already have the book. Uh, if not, I definitely recommend it. We have it outside. Um, uh, a Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. I, I, some of you might be immigrants yourselves, and hopefully the rest of you are who may be born here uh, are the curious amongst you. Uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for, for writing this book. I think it, it's, besides being beautiful to be written, I'm always impressed that I, I'm conscious of the fact that you're doing this in your second language. Uh, but beautifully written, engaging book, entertaining, funny at times. But I think perhaps more importantly, I think it, it fills a void where so many books and articles on immigration are in the United States in the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You don't take a particularly partisan stand. You're not getting into the politics of it. You're looking kind of at two things, really. What is the immigrant experience? You know, what are the beauties of the experience? What are the challenges of the experience? Uh, but also, you know, what can the immigrants who are coming to the United States, what should they maybe expect? You, you go through a lot of things here that will surprise a lot of immigrants and also maybe a lot of Americans and what, what it is about coming to the United States and, and making it your own. And I think also for those uh, who were you know, fortunate enough and lucky enough to be born in the United States and they've been, their family's been here for a while, I think it's a great way to learn a little bit more about what makes it so unique to live in the United States. Um, you know, a lot of re excellent reviews, they call this, you know, in addition to your excellent books, uh, you know, books and also your books on poetry, your love letter to America. Um, you know, I think maybe one place we could just start is um, a little bit if you could talk about how it was for your own immigrant experience coming from Iran a few years after the revolution, obviously very different father. Um, but one of the most reassuring things you said when you first arrived was finally being in a place where the king, uh, the law is the king, where there is a sense of, of, not all the time, but most of the time the law is respected and adhered to. But the other side of that that maybe surprised you was this idea of anonymity, this idea that no matter what you've done in your former country, no matter what your achievements, what your titles, you know, what job you had, the United States at first will highlight your individualism later is going to wipe that slate clean. Can you talk about that process and how it was for you and the people you interviewed for this book to kind of come to the country, but then also have to kind of almost start with a, you know, tabula rasa? Right. Um, well, um, when I first came, I think one of the, um, and I have uh, fellow Iranian immigrants here tonight who can, um, with whom we can compare notes, but, but my feeling was one of a certain jet lag in, in that, um, you know, everybody knows that the immigrant, um, you know, or, or any traveler will take some time to adjust his or her time to the time in which, the time zone in which she or he has come to. But, but I argue um, in the book and based on my own experience that the jet lag is not just physical, it's also emotional, it's intellectual, that, that part of you uh, still lingers um, in, in the land where you came from. Um, which isn't to say that, you know, you're wistful or you necessarily want to be there, but it's just that there is, it still has a hold on you. And therefore, um, no matter how much uh, you may have chosen to be here, you are still in the grip of relationships, memories, uh, perhaps unfinished business. And so there was a jet lag and, and people would, would see me and say, well, aren't you delighted to be here? And and it was, uh, and I couldn't say that I wasn't delighted. And I didn't want to say that I wasn't delighted because I knew the moment I would say, no, I'm not <laughs> delighted, people would think that I'm not grateful. So, so that created some kind of a complex situation to be in. But, but the problem was that obviously it took years, but I was eventually delighted. But I think part of what people who were addressing me at the time was uh, expecting a reaction that I wasn't ready to have because I was uh, jet lagged um, emotionally and intellectually. Um, and the other thing that, that you mentioned is this um, strange sense of anonymity um, because um, again, I'm sure fellow immigrants in this crowd can attest to this, that you know, from the moment you arrive in, in the United States, 
uh, it truly doesn't matter um, how much you've accomplished or what you've accomplished. Uh, you suddenly, um, it's like a car, sometimes I've used this metaphor, that, that has, uh, has to somehow be reset um, in its odometer at zero, even though it's a used car. So, so I felt like at some point, uh, here I am, a person with an entire history um, and memories and you know relatives and background, but here I am, you know, not really able to be recognized for for that past, and somehow need to reset um, and begin at zero again. And I know many many immigrants um, uh, have that experience, which uh, which is uh, somewhat about to uh, the experience of being ushered into a sense of anonymity and starting um, from a place where you know nobody recognizes you. It can be liberating not to be recognized because you want to blend in, but at the same time, it's um, it's also it can be uh, it can hurt your feelings because you you want to be recognized for who you are and what you've accomplished. Um, so all of that is 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 a uh, is sort of a soup in which we as immigrants um, kind of uh, swim in when we first arrive. You, you mentioned um, that I wrote the book uh, that is not a partisan book. And the reason was I, I began thinking about this in 2016 um, when, when um, everything um, was about partisanship. And, and I felt that I didn't want to be um, part of the left or the right. I didn't want to be um, yet another angry uh, voice in, in a very angry landscape. And therefore, um, I tried to um, do the one thing that I knew I could do, which was to make the immigrant uh, knowable, accessible, because the immigrant was being painted as dangerous, as criminal, as somebody to be worried about, as somebody to uh, not want in our communities. And, and I thought rather than, you know, take the debate on, you know, um, all I have to do is uh, to make this immigrant who is being painted in such a way, um, uh, somebody that readers can um, get under the skin of and get to know, and that's really the effort of the book. Yeah, and, and you do it, you know, beautifully. Um, <laughs> you come to a lot of our events. This book was a lot, a lot more enjoyable, a lot more lighthearted and, and entertaining than some of the books have to we cover on geopolitics and whatnot. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Uh, you know, you noticed your metaphor of a car. Another, I think, wonderful metaphor you have in here is the metaphor of the marriage. Uh, you talk about assimilation. Obviously, there's no defining point when you might feel assimilated to the United States or when someone else might consider you to be so. But you you compare it to a marriage in that you 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 know you come to love the United States. Uh, you could come to understand its good parts, its bad parts, and its flaws. But you come to love it deeply, and and really it is you know that challenge, the good parts and the bad parts of marriage, but hopefully hopefully good. Could you talk about maybe your own ideas of assimilation, or maybe for yourself, what's an example of when you felt like you reached that point? Um, you know, I think part of what I at some point recognized, and it it wasn't quickly, um, it took a little while, but I realized that. Um, you know, there were days that I had experiences, whether it was a conversation with somebody, um, in particular in my first year of college in the United States, um, I had a university professor who, um, who had followed uh, Iranian history and, you know, Iranian revolutionary history. And, and he took me on as a research assistant, which was very odd because um, in my first year of college, I had yet to declare a major, so I could not possibly be useful to anybody as, as a research assistant. But I think he understood um, what I'd been through just by virtue of having observed Iran, and and so he took me on, and I would, um, and I really uh, didn't do any research. What we did was um, he cared enough to know that 
um, the, the adjustment would, must be very difficult for me and, and simply talk to me and ask me, you know, what had happened, what I had observed, you know, um, what I had seen in Iran, what I was hoping, what I was reading. It was, it was really, um, maybe it was therapy, I don't know. But, but being in his office uh, felt like uh, an arrival of sorts because arrival isn't just landing here. Uh, arrival isn't just crossing the border. Arrival is about um, becoming comfortable. Uh, arrival is about feeling that you have uh, come home or you may be close to coming home. And therefore, I think assimilation, and, and in the sense that I'm speaking about uh, the notion of arrival, is unfolds through multiple stages. And whether it's through relationships that one establishes or um, you know, job opportunities that you seek where you find um, the pleasure of doing what you love or um, mastering the language, which for me was incredibly important, um, it, it unfolded in stages. And, and so um, I thought it was important to talk about this as an unfolding process um, so that people uh, who thought, you know, a neighbor who doesn't speak English immediately or is still um, thinking about the old country isn't necessarily uh, not going to be a good American because, um, because there are ways in which we ourselves as immigrants are trying to um, figure th things out, um, both emotionally, intellectually, and in every other way. And, and through this long process, um, we come to recognize feelings that, um, that we don't even know we have. Uh, an example that I uh, speak about, I think, in the book, um, I've written about it as an essay, is that you know my father used to, uh, who passed away a few years ago, um, um, wrote poetry in Persian, and um, and he had this way of sitting on the balcony um, of their apartment, uh, which was in Queens, New York, where he had a view of the World Trade Center. Um, so he would he he had a way of you know making a particular time every afternoon where he took his pen and. Um, a notebook, went to the balcony, um, you know, he had geraniums that he took care of, he watered, and then he, he put his chair in such a way that he, he had a view of the World Trade Towers, and then sat there. And you would think that my father, who is sitting in Queens, New York, looking at the World Trade Center, would be composing poems about New York. No. My father was composing poems about Iran and how much he wanted to be back there. And, and I used to watch this and say, this is totally crazy, you know. Uh, he ran away from Iran, he obviously couldn't stay. And now he's here and he's still writing poems about this other country. And then came 9-11. And, and that morning I happened to be there um, at my parents' apartment. And my father... Uh, watches the news um, and runs to the balcony where he sees nothing but a big plume of smoke in the horizon where he used to see the towers. And then he says nothing to my mother and me, and then he disappears. He goes out, um, and after a few minutes, he comes back, you know, a cane in hand and then a plastic bag. In the other hand, he goes to the balcony. Now, this is less than two hours after the planes have struck the World Trade South Towers. Um, he goes to the balcony, he takes the geranium pots down, he uh, lays them on the floor, and then out of this plastic bag comes a giant American flag. And he, he starts to tie um, the flag to the railings of the balcony. And I'm thinking to myself, whatever happened to all the poems he was writing on this balcony uh, about Iran? 
And that day, I think both of us recognized something that perhaps neither one of us knew. I never knew that that was just a hobby. You know, these, the poetry that he was writing was simply a hobby. And, and perhaps he too realized that if push comes to shove, and if this place that he has come to comes under real threat, then he's a patriot. And, and so um, I think what's important to recognize, especially when um, immigrants are coming under such attack and people talk about, you know, uh, why don't they learn English? My father never really spoke English. Um, we, we have to understand them, meet them where they are, and, and measure their attachment and their loyalty or patriotism in ways that they are comfortable and capable of expressing. And that was the biggest lesson um, that I took away from that incident on the balcony. And I think another thing that was beautiful in it, that you recount the story, um, I think you said your father was crying, but he was crying for two reasons. One, for the sadness for what, what was happening to the United States, but also perhaps unexpectedly crying out of joy for the sense that you truly knew now and he could express it, that this is his home and he belonged. Yes, exactly. You um, summarize it better than I did. But um, we can surprise ourselves. Um, I think another thing that really uh, shocked me that day was that I had never seen my father with a flag of any country. I, I, I was stunned to know that he knew how to do this, that he knew, um, he put all this together, that you know the country had come under attack, and so he was going to grab a flag and, and you know, uh, hang it on the railings. I mean, the fact that he, uh, somebody who had never been caught with a flag uh, had figured all of that out under two hours um, was very stunning to me. And, um, and it also says something else, I think, about uh, our relationships with the flag, right? In America, we have, um, you know, we love the flag because um, it's the flag of a democratic country. Um, whereas, you know, if you are not from a democratic place, then the flag becomes the representative of this other system, of this other government that you don't believe in or you don't trust, and therefore you don't embrace the flag. So I think oftentimes people expect, you know, the curious, the native-born Americans, expect the uh, immigrant to have a similar relationship to the flag, but it's going to take time because the immigrant needs to figure out that this flag is not the flag of the country that they've left behind, that this is a flag that they can, in fact, embrace. And can you talk about another thing I found you know, very interesting in your book? Um, a lot of immigrants come here, but you know, it's, it's a credible country, the land of, 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 of human rights being respected, you know, for the most part, rights that don't exist in many other corners of the world, unfortunately. But it did surprise you, and I think surprises other immigrants, the kind of preeminence and kind of uh, you know, position the, of that of the individual it carries in the United States. You mentioned it's res, risen to the level of nobility. You talk about, in the end, the treasure itself is the self. You talk about the surprise and adjusting to the fact of being in a place where the individual, for better or worse, is really at the core of a lot of communities, you know, perhaps even above and beyond your family, beyond your group, beyond your community. Yes. Um... So one of the stories that I recount in the book, and, and I don't recount them as stories, they're all woven, as you well know, into the fabric of the book. Um, it came out of um, uh, one of the interviews I conducted with, um, uh, uh, she happened to be also an Iranian uh, immigrant female, and, and she had come to do a um, three-month exchange program at, um, at Yale University, um, and she was going to do uh, just a you know, short stay um, at the medical school at Yale and then go back. Um, and sometime into the second month of her experience at Yale, um, she comes to the conclusion 
that she can't go back. And I asked her why. And she said, it wasn't because anything they were teaching me. I was, a, was an excellent student. I knew how to read the books. Um, I had taught myself English. I knew the language. I had access to the science. Um, so that wasn't um, what I was learning from that experience. So I said, so what was it? You know, because she was attending these grand rounds. She was, um, you know, going to medical conferences. She was uh, gathering with groups of doctors in smaller uh, gatherings. And she said, um, while I was in these meetings, in these rounds with my superiors, um, they would always stop to say or ask what my opinion was. And she said, that is the experience I cannot live without anymore. That she had finally come to a place where um, her superiors would turn to her and express to her through the question, um, wishing to know what she thought. And, and that experience was the one thing for which she was willing to um, to switch countries, to switch, in some ways, allegiances. It was the singular uh, reason why she realized that once she had known that, she could never go back, which is precisely what happened. So, um, so I think it, what that experience ultimately conveyed was that she learned that she was an individual. She learned that she had opinions. She learned that um, even when she was among a, a crowd of, you know, older men or women, um, uh, what she had to say mattered. And I think that uh, was incredibly important. And that's um, probably one of the aspects of the American experience that those who are born and raised in this country um, are so used to that they can't recognize um, in some ways, that they expect the rest of the world um, to be operating in the same way. And we'll probably be shocked if, you know, we were to switch places um, and recognize that that is not necessarily so, that most other societies around the world um, consider the unit of the society um, uh, to be the family or, or a tribe. And so to come here suddenly and to know that we um, singularly um, have one vote, that we have rights, that, um, you know, whether that sometimes those rights um, are not granted to us is another story. But, um, but officially, we have those rights and we know that we can demand them. These are incredible things. Another, you know, very interesting, I think, insight you had in terms of um, kind of a paradoxically kind of unexpected challenge uh, for immigrants, especially if, if they come from a country with a repressive regime, um, a regime where you mentioned the one positive perhaps of repressive regimes that keeps you alert, keeps you on your toes, keeps you focused, keeps you thinking about how, what do I do today, what do I do tomorrow, that one of the unexpected, you know, outcomes for you and others was... Um, what do you do with freedom? You know, what do you do um, when there isn't this overbearing, you know, leader or party or regime there that perhaps in some ways it can actually almost lead to confusion or even laziness? How, how do you kind of explain that? Um, right. So um, there's, a, there's a passage in the book, and I think that's where you, um, um, you uh, were gleaning all this, uh, where I talk about how shocked the immigrant can be um, watching a group of Americans go bird watching um, because, you know, who has the time to go bird watching? You know, if you live under a tyranny, there's so much to worry about from the moment you leave your home that, um, you know, such leisure activities um, will never uh, present themselves as daily opportunities in your life. So, um, one of the, you know, an example that I can um, present is um, 
you know, a Russian immigrant once told me that um, every time he left the house, he was so worried um, about watching to be sure who he was, who was following him, and whether or not he was under surveillance, or um, you know, or or his steps uh, were being observed. That uh, being outdoors was a chore for him, and unless he had to be out, uh, he preferred to be, you know, inside, uh, inside someone's home, if not himself, uh, his own home. So, um, so I think then suddenly when you come to this country and you don't have all of that stress, you don't have to worry about who's following you or, um, uh, you know, whatever else it is that you do, or mandatory demonstrations and protests that you often have to um, appear at in, in, uh, in these um, autocratic countries, then suddenly you have a lot of time, <laughs> you know. Um, and in addition to uh, finding yourself with a lot of time, you also realize that there, you know, that, that hostility that existed in your previous life gave a, a definite sense of who you are and who you're not, who you are and who your enemy is. And, and once, once that enemy has been removed from your life, then you have to figure out who you are still without that enemy. So I think, um, I think freedom for a new immigrant um, who comes from such an experience um, can be disorienting in that um, you have to completely reorient yourself in, in a place where um, it's not your opposition to, to a government uh, or, or to whoever it is outside that could come after you that defines you or organizes your life. Um, it is simply you and, um, and then the wishes and, and the dreams you have for yourself in the future. I think one of the most kind of poignant and touching parts of the book is uh, when you address the added difficulties of, of those families who were separated, who uh, maybe your, your own family included, your father was able to come for a good while after yourself and your mother. Um, but you, you note something that might surprise people that for those who are separated, for instance, if there's just one parent here in the United States, working extremely hard, perhaps maybe more hours longer than they should have, they're working so that, you say, working so that they could love, mm -hmm. that they can't be with their family, but that's perhaps the only way they feel they can express their love, to be able to send some remittance home, send some packages home. Can you talk about the, the difficulties of those separated families, and, and sadly, sometimes, even when they are able to reunite, that some of, you know, the shadows of what have gone on over the years since then, that it might, the families might never be the same again. Exactly. You know, we, um, we think about immigration, but um, we, what, what gets left out of uh, the conversation about immigration is that um, those who come here uh, not by choice, you know, whether they come here because of economic pressure um, or, or, you know, religious or other forms of persecution, um, and have to leave families behind, um, they may not become whole even um, after years that, that the families may be reunited. That, that something about this rift um, becomes unbridgeable uh, over time. And I think that's um, one of the uh, grave costs of immigration. Um, I think for those who uh, emigrate for economic reasons, uh, oftentimes, um, the one who's here sending packages or sending remittances hopes that uh, these material things can make up for um, for the actual uh, for the absence for for the lack of the uh, physical presence, and and I think they find that oftentimes uh, it it never can. So um, we all pay a great deal for it eventually, uh, one way or another. Uh, and you mentioned earlier the idea of uh, patriotism. Uh, I really liked your discussions on Americans and volunteering and supporting and assisting. Can you talk about how that surprised you, the level at which, and, 
and, and you can talk to people from first world countries, developing countries, third world countries, from Japan, South Korea, Western Europe. Everyone, I think, is amazed at the level of, of involvement of Americans and the level of, of you know, dedications to their churches or some charitable organizations. And how that surprised you and how you really saw that as a way of people expressing their patriotism. Right. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting because um, I am not talking about charity when I'm talking about volunteerism, volunteerism because, um, because I saw uh, a lot of acts of charity and, and, you know, people from all sorts of uh, different countries within their own communities um, are incredibly loving and giving and generous. Um, but but the, the American volunteerism is not about charity. It, it's entirely, something entirely different. It's, it's what you do for people you don't even know, for people who, um, you know, under ordinary circumstances, you would never even come into contact with. And I think, you know, the most shocking of, of these volunteer, volunteer activities is um, Peace Corps. You know, you, you have this, you know, 18 year old, 19 year old who uh, graduates from high school and then decides to take a year off and, you know, where are you going? Africa, <laughs> you know? And so uh, this kid from, I don't know, uh, some middle American city, uh, decides to get all sorts of shots and vaccinations and off he or she goes to this place where nobody in his family or her family has ever been um, and, and thinks that it is for her to do a good deed in this other land where she doesn't speak the language or knows anyone. Now, maybe for the rest of you, um, this isn't staggering, but but given that it's not a common practice anywhere else in the world, uh, I find it incredibly staggering. And, and the spirit um, that fosters uh, this, this sort of, um, you know, really brave act um, is, I think, incredibly uh, admirable. In fact, I think... Um, Peace Corps in particular, and these sorts of um, and these sorts of volunteer activities are um, some of the most unsung aspects of um, of Americanism, and and some of the most beautiful ones. And uh, and by the way, I just want to say that um, some of my closest friends um, and people I've really admired in my life, including the um, former American ambassador um, who was killed in Benghazi, um, Chris Stevens, um, had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. And, and this is how uh, eventually we ended up meeting at, at a gathering of uh, uh, Peace Corps volunteers that I happened to attend. So. Yeah, it was a, and I would, I'll just say, just secondarily of, of the different people in the State Department and, and about other ambassadors knew him that he was truly a, a great American and, and sadly so devoted and so willing to put himself out there on yeah. the line in Libya. Absolutely. Um, and that he was out, you know, in Benghazi, he wasn't in the capital, that he wanted to be amongst the, the Libyan people. Yeah. And that was really the, yeah. a great tragedy. Um, I, I think another important part in your book, uh, I think you, you note that for all the immigrant groups, all the ones who come over the years, you know, start with the, you know, the Germans and then the Irish and the Italians and, you know, Puerto Ricans and go on and on from there, that you know that all immigrant groups, you yourself included, everyone who finally got to a point where they felt they could get a degree of equality, could get a degree of tolerance, a, a big deal of gratitude to the African American community um, for all that they had struggled for since you know the, the really the group of Americans that have been here longer than anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you also kind of touch upon it in a, in a beautiful way. You, maybe you could discuss the story of the very first time you and your mother actually had to be separated from each other after you first arrived uh, in the U.S. Right. Um, so I'll tell that story first, but. Um but I just want to make sure that people know that the book is not a memoir. Uh, I just happened to 
uh, you know, collate a lot of different experiences uh, and, and round them up into one bundle. Um, and there are here and there some, some recollections of, from my own, um, you know, uh, experiences in America, but uh, it isn't a memoir. So that said, um, about a few months after we had arrived in the United States, um, and I had, uh, like so many other immigrant children, become my parents' parent. Um, my mother and I uh, were, um, had to separate from each other because I had found a job at last, and I, I had to stay uh, where uh, she and I were at, which was in New York City, and, and she was going to take the subway and go back to Brooklyn, which is where our home was at the time. And, and so I was so worried about my mother getting lost that I walked uh, her to the subway platform and I um, knew that she had to catch the end train and I put her on the end train and then um, said to her, you have to get off on 55th Street Station, 55th. Don't get out of the subway, stay on until you see 55th Street. <laughs> so I remember, you know, until the doors shut, I was going like this uh, over and over again. And as soon as the doors shut, um, there is this intercom voice that, like, all, you know, that really anybody who uh, has ever lived in New York for any significant point, uh, uh, period of time, has heard that as soon as the door shut, uh, some conductor announced, this N, line, this N train is going to run on the R line. So, <laughs> which, is, which is really uh, the only thing about New York that reminds me of Tehran, you know, the place where I came from, because, you know, it, it has that sort of chaos. So I'm thinking, God damn, you know, it, it said N, uh, it was the end platform. There is no reason why I shouldn't have thought that this is an end train, but you know, here it was. So my my mother um, was going not in the direction of Brooklyn, but in the direction of Queens, and and so I panicked. I immediately, you know, it was I think my first or second day on the job. I had to call and say that I can't come. Uh, and I tried to explain to them to the best uh, of the, my English at the time would allow. And then I ran home. Um, she wasn't there, obviously. Um, and then I, you know, I waited a few hours. She didn't show up. I went to the police station and they said, you know, we don't take anything like this seriously until, you know, a couple of days pass. Um, so I went back home and it was uh, dusk and I was worried as hell and I called my brothers and everybody you know came and we were trying to kind of convene a family meeting to try to figure out how to go find her and then um, just as we were absolutely at our wits end the the door there's a knock on the door and my mother walks in with this African-American woman who is wearing a um, a New York Transit Authority uniform, and, and my mother is sobbing, 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 and she says in Persian, this woman saved my life. And, and the woman, who clearly doesn't know what my mother is saying, says, uh, I saw that she uh, didn't speak the language, uh, didn't, had clearly got lost, um, I understood at the end that she wanted to go to 55th Street in Brooklyn, and so I said, you just stay on my train and I will take you home when my shift is over, which is precisely what she did. And, and this was, um, you know, this was very incredible to me because um, early on when we uh, arrived, so many other immigrants who wanted to give us advice said, you have to be careful about these African Americans, they are very dangerous. And I was thinking, well, you know, if she weren't around, then where would we be today uh, without her? So to make a long story short, um, you know, in, in thinking about uh, what the struggles of the African American community has 
um, done to or for uh, immigrants. I have to say that I believe their push toward greater equality has created a space in which the rest of us who look different, who speak differently, who um, come from different backgrounds are um, more fit in more easily or um, have an easier time being sort of digested by the society or understood. So I think um, in some ways their struggle to, to become equal citizens, their struggle to uh, gain equal rights um, has created a greater uh, opportunity for um, all of us who come from other places, you know, not Western nations especially, um, to have an easier time um, making a transition to this country. And that is the reason why I think we all, uh, whether we recognize it or not, um, uh, owe them a debt of gratitude. Absolutely. Um, and if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to yeah, hand the, if you have those question cards and give to Tatiana, uh, or if any of you watching the live stream, feel free to submit them through there as well. Um, maybe just another question or two before we get to audience questions. The one, probably maybe the one group you, you are critical of, and, and I think probably rightly so, is you note that perhaps the group within the United States who has the most reason to be thankful, the most reason to be grateful, uh, a lot of times the elite themselves, some of the well-educated, you know, you know, highfalutin elite, whatever you like to call them, are also the ones that you say almost take it as a faith to be critical of the United States. Right. Um, can you talk about that kind of unusual paradox and, and how it maybe, I suppose, kind of really uh, troubles you? Right, right. I mean, it's the very people who can most afford it, you know, the, the, um, the elite who um, have never lived elsewhere because they've been born and raised here, um, the elite who um, are wealthy or super educated um, seem to um, think that, I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing, but um, I often see them uh, be uh, really um, make a fashionable statement out of being um, grandly anti-American, um, uh, categorically anti-American. I say that in particular because um, it, because a lot of times when I go to give talks, people uh, they come up to me and say, um, you know, in in trying to express sympathy that, um, you know, we Americans made a mess in your country. Okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I, I have often found that statement incredibly uh, amusing because um, on one hand, it's uh, endowing America with uh, so much power to mess up uh, the an entire country with far greater history and civilization than even this country uh, in one swoop. Um, and it leaves nothing for the nation, um, you know, for the nation's agency. So, um, so yes, I, I find it incredibly uh, jarring that, um, that it has become um, a fashionable thing to, um, to just, you know, be sweepingly uh, critical of um, of the United States, even um, when that categorical criticism comes at the cost of completely deleting the agency of the nations. Um, and yeah, and just a, a last question. I know I, know, I think Tatiana is collecting a few uh, and Maureen as well, Marco, uh, audience questions. Um, you close the book in, in a beautiful place. Uh, it's a place I have fond and proud memories of myself yeah. when I was in my 20s, uh, and that's the process of being sworn in as an American citizen with an array of people from all over the world. It might be a judge or some polit political official, 
um, you know, taking you through the story in process. You you note the, the the two parts that people might remember. A lot of people remember that official, whatever man or woman it is, might know your new right your new rights as an American citizen. They also usually typically will highlight your responsibilities. Your need to defend the Constitution. You need to be an active participant in the vote. Your need to, if necessary, defend the country. Can you talk about? Uh, I suppose what you would hope. You know. New, you know, newly naturalized American citizens and immigrants and really all Americans would take away with regards to what are our responsibilities to maintain this country. Right. Um, so I think, um, well, first of all, the book ends with the naturalization ceremony. And I've always uh, thought that how hard we as immigrants work to get to that place. You know, how many interviews, how many tests, how many uh, screenings, how many applications. Um, you know, and, and I mentioned um, before that, you know, the citizenship application, if those of you who, um, who were uh, born and raised in this country may have never seen, is over 20 pages long. And, and it goes through uh, questions that oftentimes are, uh, you know, Really absurd uh, because you know they it, it, they're just uh, tedious and and they go through um, details that um, for instance you know my mom and dad who were in in um, uh, first of all they were both educators in Iran but um, but he so they had never been in uh, you know held a gun or had carried weapons with themselves. So uh, they, they come across these questions that ask them, would you bear arms on behalf of America? And I would look to my mother and my father and I would say, uh, they probably would, but they shouldn't. You know, America's better off without my parents, you know, bearing arms on, on behalf of the country. Um, so, so I think one of the things that really, um, in, in some strange way, makes us as immigrants take our civic duties more seriously is because we work um, to become naturalized citizens. We, uh, we study, we, um, we are held to a standard that those who are born here and, and just given a birth certificate um, never get to experience. And therefore, I think in some ways, um, we uh, have a deeper understanding of it. Um, not to mention that certain things that, you know, you guys who have been born and raised here take for granted isn't lost on us. Um, and perhaps I can close um, uh, with this uh, instance that um, I, had, I had a friend who had just uh, emigrated to the United States and, you know, um, she had worked uh, all week and, you know, the weekend came along and I said to her, you know, and she said, what should we do? I said, well, you know, we can start by going shopping, especially since I have a sweater I have to return. And her reaction was, you return stuff? And I said, yes, you know, and, and she said, I'm not going with you because I've never been in a place where you can return things. Who, who takes stuff back after you buy? And I said, you know, we American citizens have the right that as long as we have maintained the receipt, we can, re <laughs> we can return stuff. So, so it was a grand experience of show and tell when I took her to the Gap and stood at the counter, took out a sweater that I had worn for a week, um, but it still had a tag on and, and for which I still had a receipt, put it on the counter and got my money back and, and she was um, stunned. Uh, so, so it's this sort of thing that, that um, you know, you, um, you know, most people who have read the book say, you can't return stuff in other countries. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, this is, this is one of those uh, uniquely American miracles. And I can, you know, go through numerous examples that it is because of that receipt. It is because of this, you know, numerous social contracts 
that acknowledges us as individuals with rights, that we manage to have um, the comfortable, pleasant lives that we are conducting in this country. And maybe I'll, a, a quick aside on the returning thing. I've, I've been here most of my life, but even still, sometimes it surprises me. Um, my my wife and her family from South Texas. My mother in law is from South Texas, and about seven or eight years ago, we uh, I took her to visit my my family in Ireland, and, and we were there for you know, two or three great weeks, and then got back. And I was I was talking with her a few weeks after we got back, and I said, you know, uh, Dottie. I don't remember why, but I was moving things in the room. I said, Dottie, where's your suitcase from the trip? She said, oh, I returned it. <laughs> and I was like, your suitcase has been to Europe and back, and you returned it. She said, well, it's in perfectly good shape. And, and Marshalls was happy to take it. There was nothing wrong with it. So, um, and that, and that, that is, that's true. And that reminded you that you're Irish. And yes. she's American, right? yes. <laughs> so I think that's definitely my record for, for the distance of returned item is traveling to home. Um, uh, interesting question here from Mike. Mike asks, uh, I worked in health care in the Texas prison system, I made an unscientific observation that immigrant populations are significantly underrepresented in the prison population. Can you comment on that? Yes. So isn't that, uh, who's Mike? Oh, hi. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an incredible thing how much misinformation can circulate in, in our society uh, without having any basis in the truth. So, one of the things that we kept hearing was how much our communities become unsafe and dangerous when immigrants enter them. And the truth is that um, a lot of the um, you know, bordering communities or communities where there are a higher number of immigrants uh, in them are, um, tend to be uh, safer communities than, than communities where they're not in. And therefore, I think they, um, you know, in, in prisons, there are less of them than there are, you know, um, Americans who've been in the, born and raised in this country. So, you know, it's a, I think that observation by itself is, uh, along with the fact that um, we know uh, that communities with immigrants in them tend to have less crimes, um, crime rates um, show that you know, everything we hear about immigrants coming here to commit crimes is simply uh, just, you know, ludicrous. Um, another thing that I thought the first time I heard, you know, immigrants come here to commit crimes, and I was, the first thought that went through my head was that, wait, when I first came, all I was trying to do was mm, not to get lost, you know, and and speak in such a way that somebody wouldn't tell me, I beg your pardon, because I was, I so hated hearing, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. Um, so I thought, you know, if, if anybody, if these people had actually immigrated, they would know that uh, <laughs> it, it takes uh, so much effort uh, to function uh, in, in those early months. Uh, that, that it becomes very hard to do anything else above that, including, you know, commit whatever, you know, wrongdoing, so. Uh, interesting question here. Uh, uh, I suppose it's, it's short, um, so I'm not sure exactly which uh, way they might be uh, wanting to, to look into or infer, but uh, someone asked, what is your definition of an immigrant? Um, in the book, it's it's pretty wide. I, I talk about undocumented immigrants. I talk about um, people who uh, have crossed the border uh, without, um, without you know, papers, uh, uh, without permission. Uh, I, I talk about um, pretty much everybody. Um, and, and while this uh, obviously is impossible to have a book about all the immigrants, I just wanted to draw upon the overarching experiences of people who, um, who find themselves um, in this country. You know, we, so many of us obviously um, have come from our own unique backgrounds and uh, bring 
uh, our own unique experiences and flavors, um, and therefore, you know, our process of adjusting, assimilating, uh, differ from others. But I think, even uh, with all those differences, the experience of um, coming to a whole new country, being uprooted, has some uh, common denominators. And the book is about uh, as many as those common denominators that I could collect in one volume. And the reason I wanted to do that, by the way, was because I got tired of hearing, oh, Polish immigrants are such and such, but, you know, the Chinese immigrants are such and such. Whereas the Korean immigrants are such and such. And I thought, and even in the immigrant immigration books that I was reading, you would find, you know, even discussions around which are the best immigrant communities uh, to, to have more of and which are the, you know, immigrant groups that we should um, take in more of. And apparently, you know, our former president wanted more from Norway, you know, whereas nobody probably told him that people from Norway don't want to come here. You know, <laughs> you know it's a, that, that was a different thing. But, but I somehow felt that um, I got tired of hearing that we are, we are all these different people who had no, nothing in common that there was no shared strand that we had together. And I thought if, uh, you know, if we can all come together to be Americans despite our differences, then perhaps within the immigrant experiences, there are shared experiences that turn us into an immigrant community regardless of where we come from. I wanted to emphasize the common experiences as opposed to the divisions. And that could simply be because I didn't want to hear um, about all the things that was dividing us or should be dividing us. I was looking for, for things that could bring us together for our shared experiences. That's great. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll get these last two audience questions and just perhaps go through them a, a little uh, quickly, if, if possible. Uh, someone asks, what type of relationship do you have with your own Iranian expat community, and have you become involved in Iranian politics? Um, you know, my, my previous two books uh, were about, um, you know, the, my first book was about um, growing up in Iran under uh, during the time of upheaval and transformation, the Iranian revolution, and my second book was also um, a non-fictional account of um, a, an assassin, a political assassination. So um, it has been a, a very important part of me that has informed uh, the way I see so much else. Um, but that said, I have to say that uh, given that I've been in this country for 30 um, plus years, um, I most of my interest uh, in in the past and in Iran is uh, is as an American. I I look at that history to to try to explain it so that we as Americans gain a better understanding and make the better decisions. Um, but aside from that, I uh, you know nothing of the past as I knew it. Uh, remains of my life there anymore. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> last audience question, and maybe to, to, to broaden it out from there. Someone asked, how old were you when you arrived in the U.S.? And then maybe just uh, along with that, in closing, what would you like the audience to, to take away from, from you, not just your own experience, but your, your dozens and dozens of interviews and, and kind of research on the immigrant experience? Mm -hmm. um, I was 19 when I, when I came, and... Um, um, and I came without um, English, without, um, I, I came here as a refugee, and um, I, I think perhaps one of the most important things, and it can't be the only thing that I want to leave the audiences with, is that, um, you know, we're looking to find 
what it is that can make us trust our immigrant communities. You know, do what qualities do we look for in in our immigrants in order to know that they make good Americans and they make they will eventually become patriots. And I I talk about this because I think you know in 2016 in the past few years um, so many times I felt even though I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen and have been for a long time. I felt that I was coming under assault. Um, you know, on one hand, I heard uh, there were rumors that, you know, immigrants who don't speak English shouldn't enter the country. And I thought, oh, I didn't speak English when, you know, I was allowed in. Um, or, you know, it, Iran was placed under a Muslim ban. And I thought, oh, you know, if the Muslim ban had been in place when I wanted to apply, I wouldn't have gotten in. Um, or, you know, a, a, a multitude of things that um, we keep hearing about. Immigrants who don't have wealth, who don't have skills, um, should not come into this country. I had no wealth, I had no skills, and and I think I'm an okay citizen now. And, and if America took a gamble on me, I, I don't think it was a terrible gamble. So looking at that, at that experience, I, I would like for all of us to try to think of, of values greater than, um, than these, you know, than, than the things that we've been told are important and that, um, and that an immigrant can eventually uh, and not only surprise us, um, as I hope I have done, but also surprise himself or herself by the way in which she or he finds himself one day a true patriot. Well, thank you. And uh, as I mentioned before, I know some of you already have it. We have Roy's excellent book, A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious, and she will kindly will hang around as well if any of you want to get the book signed. And uh, on behalf of everyone on the council, all of our members and guests, it's teachers and students, and everyone watching it at home, uh, hopefully you're not still at work. Uh, Roy, thank you so much for this wonderful evening, and, and all the best, and thank you so much for what you've done you know, for, for immigrants more broadly. Thank you. Thank you.